So this is the, the third part. And uh, again, the purpose was to focus on what had been lost down through the ages and what had been preserved and what was then eventually recovered to the church. And we'd kind of come up through the very dark period of Thyatira. And um, so we're going to now go on to the last three where we get uh, much of what was really recovered to the church. So just a quick review again. We we are gone have gone through Ephesus, Smyrna, and Pergamus. Those three stages are past and over Thyatira. We looked at that goes on to the end, um, and uh, now we will take up Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. They also all continue to the end of the church's history in this world. So I just wanted to go and quick review what was lost. And these aren't exhaustive lists by any means, but the true nature and unity of the church and the truth of the Holy Spirit's presence and action in the assembly and the consequent uh, simplicity and divine order in the assembly. The heavenly calling and hope of the church was lost the distinction between Israel and the church, the millennial reign of Christ and Israel's future restoration and glory. And then as to the individual salvation by faith alone, works got mixed in, and certainly baptism became bound in that too as necessary for salvation. Eternal security of the believer and the priesthood of all believers. All of those things were quickly lost early on, and then we found that uh, what was vital was preserved, the eternal sonship of Christ, the sinless humanity, his divinity, those relationships in the Godhead, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the, uh, the fact of Christ's suffering, shed blood, resurrection, being necessary for salvation, the completed canon of scripture was preserved to us, but all of those things were attacked and they had to be defended and sometimes at the cost of martyrdom. So the question was, will the Lord leave the church in that condition, the professing church in this world? And we can thank the Lord that he uh, did not. And so there began to be a work of the Spirit of God in the uh, early 1500s. And it's not that the Spirit of God wasn't working prior to that. There were many faithful believers that labored and suffered leading up to that time to the Reformation. So I just put that verse up there. And herein is that saying true, one soweth and another reapeth. There had been much sowing up to the Reformation, but the time came for reaping. And uh, when that time came, no one was going to be able to stand against the work of God and succeed. So Luther is probably really the person we think of mainly in connection with the Reformation. So we're going to look particularly at Luther. And uh, he was a Augustinian monk in the Catholic Church and went through many wrestlings in his soul early on and finally uh, came to the point where he really um, uh, through others in the catholic church uh, bringing the word of god before him uh, came into blessing in his soul and an old monk unidentified said to luther in one of these times when he was just in agony over his soul's condition as to his uh, eternal destiny. He said to him, hear what St. Bernard says, the testimony of the Holy Ghost to thy heart is this, thy sins are forgiven thee. And at that moment, uh, such a relief, divine light entered into the heart of Luther. But there was more to come as he went on in his studies and became finally uh, uh, ordained to be able to teach the scriptures and preach them. He was going through Romans and he didn't get too far 
just to Romans 117 and that clause in that verse, the just shall live by faith. And uh, as Andrew Miller says, a light we may say beyond the brightness of the sun filled his whole soul. And he began to preach those things, salvation by faith alone. He would use the expression justification by faith alone. Um, I tend to use the word salvation uh, in referring to it because I think the full truth of justification didn't really come out until much later recovery of the truth. But that would be the byword of the Reformation, justification by faith. Well, the other thing that was happening at that time is this St. Peter's Cathedral, an old wooden structure, or wooden foundation was falling apart in Rome and the Pope wanted to build a brand new grand structure. And so came up with the uh, plan to sell indulgences, which had been part of church doctrine for many years, which uh, would raise money to build uh, St. Peter's Cathedral, a new one. And so those uh, indulgences were sold far and wide in the uh, uh, sphere of the Catholic Church, but especially in Germany, there was a tremendous abuse of their sale. And uh, that really came to the attention of Luther. The, uh, there was a, Johann Tetzel was the man who was a, at the lead of making money for the Pope and selling those indulgences. And he would, uh, in selling them, say, as soon as the coins uh, ring at the bottom of the of the box, when you put them in, souls are released from purgatory. And he that he had more power uh, than even the Apostle Peter uh, and to save souls and just tremendous, awful claims, really um, blasphemous claims that he made in connection with the indulgences. And people would, uh, uh, through fear, would contribute, though um, in the background they knew that this was an abuse. And some would say, well, if, if just a few coins can release souls from purgatory, then the Pope, sure, with all his money, could release a whole lot, you know? So they, they knew in a way, but they, they bowed down to this abuse. Well, uh, Luther's 95 Theses that he famously uh, uh, put on the uh, door of the Wittenberg Church um, was a call to uh, for the university there in Wittenberg to uh, take those things up and uh, discuss them. But that got taken and spread far and wide and finally was forwarded to Pope Leo and it appeared as a direct attack upon him and the Catholic Church. And so that started the ball rolling. There was a disputation in 1519 with Johann Eck and Johann Eck pressed Luther as to the, uh, the Pope's being infallible in his decisions and his word. And Luther affirmed the superiority of the scriptures over the word of the Pope. And that was the very thing Huss had done earlier and been burned at the stake. And Luther said, I am a Hussite. And uh, well, at that point, uh, his uh, excommunication was as much as done in saying that. And so he was excommunicated and the church then being bound up as we saw that mixture of, of, of uh, 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 in Thyatira with the church taking the reins of the civil world, they would just hand over uh, someone like Luther to the civil authorities to go on trial and uh, be put to death. And so he did. He went on civil trial. And that was at that famous meeting in Worms, died of Worms in 1521 AD. And he testified uh, before papal authorities, before the emperor, and at the end, he said, here I stand, I cannot do otherwise, God help me, amen. And he walked out from the middle of that crowd that would have had his blood, and the Lord preserved him. The time had come to bring relief to his people.
from all the abuses of Thyatira. That's the Reformation. But the Reformation preceded, really, what we have in this fifth letter to Sardis. The Reformation was a work of the Spirit of God, but in just a few short years, what we have presented to us in Sardis became uh, the condition of things uh, that emerged from the Reformation. So Protestantism soon followed the Reformation. So just to look at the letter to Sardis, these things saith he that hath the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know thy works, that thou hast a name, that thou livest and art dead. No vital link with God. Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die, for I have not found thy works perfect before God. Remember, therefore, how thou hast received and heard, and hold fast and repent. If therefore thou shalt not watch, I will come upon thee as a thief, and thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon thee. Thou hast a few names even in Sardis, which have not defiled their garments. They shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. He that overcometh, the same shall be clothed in white raiment, and I will not blot out his name out of the book of life, but I will confess confess his name before my father and before his angels. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. So we see with Luther saying to that uh, uh, those there in the Diet of Arms that uh, here I stand, I can do no other. He was completely cast upon the Lord for his protection. The Lord presents himself here as having the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. On the one hand, fullness of spiritual power. On the other hand, fullness of ecclesiastical power. It's all in his hands. And so as the truth that Luther was preaching spread out and went out to uh, Germany and the Spirit of God at the same time in Switzerland with uh, Zwingli, and there were others, uh, Farrell, and we don't have time to, to go into all those uh, <laughs> wonderful servants of God and what they did. But the authorities that were over the smaller states, especially in Germany at that time, um, were laboring under the burden of Rome, and they embraced the Reformation and really sought to throw off papal authority. And they protected the reformers. They reached out and they brought them under the umbrella of their civil authority and protected them. And then in the Diet of Spires in 1529, they protested against the emperor as he sought to exterminate, eradicate, uh, extinguish the Reformation. And they really rebelled against papal authority. Well, at the time, sadly, very not too long in, that uh, Reformation work became divided between the Swiss and German reformers over what was called the sacramentarian controversy, whether the bread and the wine partaken of and the remembrance of the Lord actually changed into the physical body and blood of Christ. Luther maintained that. That was what he had done as a ordained priest in the church, and he clung to that. Zwingli um, refuted it and the two parted ways, and really that resulted in what we call the Lutheran and the Reformed communions or churches and the Reformation. And they went their different ways, and it's that way to this day. Well, just down below, um, Put a little diagram there. De Vigne in his history of the Reformation raises the question, 
as the Reformation began to go on, would they preserve Episcopal order that was closest to what they had come out of uh, in the Catholic Church? Or are they going to reconstruct the ecclesiastical order just according to the scriptures, just to go back and rely on the Lord, just to trust him and, and uh, to seek to function and go on according to scriptural order. That's really the, the Lord presenting himself with the seven stars in uh, his hand. But really they took a middle ground. They took a middle ground. They didn't want to just uh, go on with Catholicism separate from the Catholic Church. Um, they didn't just completely cast themselves on the Lord. Now they were really cast upon the civil authorities. And so they took a middle ground of a political ecclesiastical constitution. That is the formation of the Reformation churches bound up, wound together, and under the power and authority of the states that they flourished in. And so really in Sardis, you get uh, the church protected and ruled by the world. And so those men became the ones who would ordain ministers and would decide on uh, on uh, spiritual questions and so on. And so a uh, result was going to be that a deadness was going to creep into that work. And so the Lord says, thou hast a name that thou livest and art dead. So orthodox doctrine, recovered truth spread, but at the same time, in that mixture of the political and and the church, uh, just a spiritual deadness, there was a lifeless formalism crept in. They'd escaped papal Rome, but had exchanged it for bondage to the governments of the world. As those things developed and grew, and the resurgence again and attacks as to the doctrines of the person of Christ came up and as to the differences between the Lutheran and Reformed churches and how they saw things, especially over the uh, sacraments, wars erupted. Sometimes it was political powers using the guise of religion for political gain. Sometimes it was using political excuses to uh, further the particular religious views that that state held. It was called the Great Wars of Religion, 1522 to 1712 AD. 50 or more wars, low estimate, 7 million died, high estimate, 18 million, the bloodiest conflicts the world has ever seen until the Great Wars great world wars of the 20th century. So much blood was shed. In England, something else developed. Henry VIII enacted the royal act of royal supremacy, claimed to be head of the church so he could have his own way. And it really opened the door finally in England to Protestantism. And what developed out of that was the Anglican Church, the Church of England. And a clash developed there between the Anglican Church and the Reformed churches, more Calvinist, and as to their cultural practices. Do we have vestments? Do we have plain robes? Do we have plain wooden benches? Do we have very nice seats? Do we have fancy churches with all the, you know, trappings that uh, the, Ang the Church of England seemed to want to hold on to, left over from Catholicism. And there was a tremendous clash there that just continued to increase. And interestingly enough, out of that came the 1611 King James Bible. King James and trying to wrestle between these two sides 
just in one of his meetings with them throughout, well, we could use a, a new good translation because he knew each site had its own translation. And so they came together, not with his funding, but with his authority. And the King James Bible was the result really of that, uh, one of the results of that clash. There were national churches identified with states. There were dissenting churches that said, no, we can't go along with this or with that. And so in among those who were dissenters arose, those who were called the Puritans, and they wanted to reform the Anglican church. And uh, they clashed again in England with the Anglican church very strongly. Around that time, a uh, man in the, who was a Dutch reformer, his picture's there in the lower right, Jacobus Arminius, uh, began to teach what we know today as Arminianism. And that resulted in a great conflict in the Dutch reformed church. He was... Uh, I believe before he could really present all his views, he died. But those that followed him uh, came up with the five points of Arminianism. And the Dutch Reformed Church responded with the five points of Calvinism. And five points of Calvinism didn't really exactly come from Calvin. That was from the Dutch Reformed Church. Well, the Puritans finally, you might say they gave up. Uh, on their efforts to uh, reform the Church of England. And uh, they weren't too well liked because they got kind of political and militant. And in the end, many of them uh, fled England and went uh, to be uh, under the care of the more the Dutch reform part of the world in Holland. And then when uh, some of these wars of religion uh, broke out in that area, they thought, well, we're going to get caught up in that. Let's go to the New World. And really, they had, you might say, millennial aspirations. And um, so they brought with them to the New World a uh, Apocalyptic vision of being God's instruments in establishing the new kingdom. John Winthrop, governor of Massachusetts Bay Colony, expressed the Puritan aspiration of building a revolutionary city, a new Jerusalem, as he said, quoting the scriptures, coming down out of heaven from God. They really thought they would establish the kingdom, bring in the millennium and the new world. I want to read this account of John Robinson's farewell address to the pilgrims in Holland, 1620. He hoped to be on the next group that went over, but he died before he could leave. But in this first group, as he organized them and got them ready to go back to England and then sail to the New World, he said, We are now ere long to part asunder, and if God should reveal anything to us by any other instruments of his to be ready to receive it as ever we were to receive any truth by his ministry. Now, this is not John Robinson saying this. This is an account of what he was saying. So this man is recounting it. For he was very confident the Lord had more truth and light yet to break out forth of his holy word. He took occasion also miserably to bewail the state and condition of the reformed churches who were come to a period in religion and would go no further than the instruments of their reformation. As for example, the Lutherans, they could not be drawn to go beyond what Luther saw. And so also saith he, you see the Calvinists, they stick where he left them, a misery much to be lamented. For though they were precious shining lights in their times, yet God had not revealed his whole will to them. And were they now living, saith he, they would be as ready and willing to embrace further light as that they had received. You know, to me, this is 
it's it's not a prophecy, but you it just is prophetic in the character of looking on to what was going to yet come in the early 1800s and him his encouraging them there's more light he he just felt there was more still to come out of the the word and there was a stagnation in the progress of the reformed the, of the reformation a little drawing of of uh, John Robinson and his farewell address it lasted all day so the next thing we want to look at is what took place pilgrims came to the new world and were sadly disappointed in their efforts to establish a new kingdom there were a lot of others that were coming to the new world for other occupations and pursuits and so on, and soon the whole Puritan movement descended into the same dead orthodoxy that they had sought to come out of. Well, the world was, Christian world was getting exhausted with those wars of religion and the empty orthodoxy all around for those who were true believers uh, affected them. And in the new world, there was just a return to worldly pleasures and vices after the Puritan influence. There were movements, Lutheran pietism and the Moravians, um, efforts to, to go back to a, a uh, religion of feelings and pious desires not just the uh, enunciation of doctrines, but of uh, reality displayed in in uh, in those feelings and expressions and pious desires and so on. And uh, Philip Spencer, who was part of that, said, "No one will be justified other than those intent upon sanctification." So there was a great focus on sanctification almost as if to make works for salvation and really that uh, that in many ways is what it became but god was preparing a revival it's called the first great awakening in the new world it was called the evangelical revival in europe and england and some of those that the lord used the wesley brothers george whitfield Jonathan Edwards, John Wesley, 1703, 1791, started the Holy Club, the Methodists, and uh, many of them were not ordained. Uh, they did go out to preach. They were rejected by the Orthodox uh, churches, um, national churches, and even the independents. And so often they preached in the open air preached wherever they could have a pulpit, and God bless George Whitfield with a tremendous booming voice that would carry uh, an incredible length in the open air. Um, sadly, the Wesleys got, uh, uh, especially John, and infected with Arminianism and developed his own version, which is probably mostly what we see around us today, Wesleyan Arminianism. But they really had an emotional revival preaching and they looked at the dead orthodoxy and they said what is needed is the new birth not really fully understanding the truth of new birth but in a sense uh using that uh scripture and in the gospel of john chapter 3 distinguishing uh from empty unreality and reality and so it was a very emotional revival preaching and gripping um, it was non-denominational or at least interdenominational gospel preaching. And so it attracted uh, people from out from all these various denominations. And that especially uh, lined right up with the spirit of things in the new world, the independency that was beginning to uh, infect the 13 colonies. So it really made progress. Uh, there, but it did as well 
in England and then really over into Europe somewhat. I've just thought of that verse in Romans 9, 29, except the Lord of Sabaoth had left us, left us a seed, we had been as Sodom and made like unto Gomorrah. As we see these declines into deadness, dead orthodoxy, outside of these revivals, um, what would have been preserved? What would be left? Nothing. Spirit of God had to work. Well, in that first great awakening, um, there were many uh, women that were used, especially in England. Uh, Countess uh, of Huntingdon and Lady Anne Erskine. If you've ever read, never read the Three Bitters poem, uh, I encourage you to look it up. It's the account of Lady Anne Erskine's conversion. Uh, through the preaching of Roland Hill, who was funded by Countess uh, Huntingdon. And these women, uh, their husbands, had in some cases died young, left them tremendous inheritances, and they just used that to fund the spread of the gospel throughout uh, the British Empire and beyond. And the result was, especially in England, that um, many turn from just worldly pleasures and vices in the empty orthodoxy of, of what had resulted in Sardis. And the result of turning away from uh, worldly things was they had more money in their pockets and they bought their kids shoes and maybe some furniture and all of these kinds of things. And the result was economic prosperity in Britain and Britain's power in the world just grew, and the English language spread around the world. It was called the the uh, the empire upon which the sun never sat. It was since it was around the world, there is the sun shining on it somewhere at any time. But anyway, um, it was a wonderful uh, revival. Over in the New World in the colonies. There had been a wonderful result with Jonathan Edwards preaching the Wesleys, Whitfield, who had traveled over there. Um, but the embracing of the Enlightenment philosophy that rose up in France and deism, believing that there is a God, but really uh, just a higher power sort of a doctrine, and then the rebellion itself against England really led to a period of darkness, spiritual and moral darkness in the United States, and it remained there until the very late 19, uh, 1790s, early 1800s, and the, what was called the Second Great Awakening. I'm going to give you a quote, a couple quotes. So many misunderstand the founding fathers of the United States and uh, Think of them as uh, great uh, Christians and so on. Well, they were Christian in name. In the Treaty of Tripoli, 1796, signed by President John Adams, the very beginning of that treaty, I quote it, the government of the United States of America is not in any sense founded on the Christian religion. And then as to George Washington, Reverend James Abercrombie, one of Washington's pastors, remarked when someone inquired about George Washington, he said, Sir, Washington was a deist. And I got a little picture there. Washington famously would never let him, a uh, painting uh, of him, uh, himself be painted kneeling on both knees. He refused it. One knee only. He would not subject himself that far. That embracing of enlightenment philosophies, deism, just dropped a veil of darkness over the early United States. England, on the other hand, um, was flourishing. Europe 
also slipped back into darkness, and that wasn't revived until the early 1800s, around the time of the Second Great Awakening. France particularly rejected the gospel, persecuted the Huguenots, embraced enlightenment, and descended into a violent revolution. The Huguenots and Calvinism were practically eradicated from France by the late 1700s. Now we come to our sixth letter. And by the time we come to the end of the 1700s, the Spirit of God is preparing for another revival and another recovery of the truth. Of Sardis, it says, I have found my works not complete before God. They got stunted when they came under the protection of the states of Europe and didn't go on to what I believe the Spirit of God would have brought them into in time. But he is going to uh, still accomplish his purpose and he begins to prepare the way. And I think in the reception of the gospel, the resulting prosperity of the British Empire, uh, the gospel really spread far and wide. And there was a revived interest in the scriptures. There was a relative peace as uh, in the empire, especially. And... and uh, the consequence of that peace enjoyed by believers was there was time uh, to study the scriptures. Those great wars of religion for all those years, those horrible bloody conflicts did not leave the saints at peace to really be in the word in the way they were going to now. And on top of that, in the French Revolution, really stirred a pro interest in the prophetic scriptures. And Napoleon crowns himself emperor in 1804 AD. And I just put that verse there. It's from Revelation on a future day. But it says, and all the world wondered after the beast. And they did with Napoleon. And there was a stirring as to uh, prophetic events and what was coming upon this world. But the Lord had uh, something in mind. And I just quote that scripture from James 5, 7. Behold, the husbandman waited for the precious fruit of the earth and hath long patience for it until he received the early and the latter rain. Well, the Lord is coming. And he's going to, the Spirit of God is going to make sure there is a people that will be ready to receive him when he comes. And so just like in Ezra's time, a remnant returned to Jerusalem, that there might be those who are waiting to receive the Lord, Messiah, when he came and he was born in Bethlehem, that there would be those of his people there ready and waiting to receive him. And so we especially see that in Luke's gospel, that little remnant appears again, uh, in uh, reception of the Lord. And uh, so there were, in the grace of God, those who were ready to receive. And well, likewise, God will have those who are looking for the Lord's return today. And there was a, going to be a call to return to the first principles of the word of God. Thou hast a little strength and hast kept my word, and it's not denied my name. So that midnight cry would go out, those sleeping virgins uh, to awake and the work of the Spirit of God to begin that uh, we are the wonderful benefactors of today. I want to read William Kelly on the state of the church at that time. Very remarkable 
article of his on the Catholic Apostolic Body or the Irvingites in the Bible Treasury. Grace hath been showed that our God may lighten our eyes and give us a little reviving in our bondage, Ezra said, and in the same way the Spirit of God was going to work in that day. And so Kelly says, when it pleased God of late to awaken the slumbering virgins by the midnight cry, not only were the wise aroused, but the foolish. Nor did Satan delay to set up counterfeits so as to bring the discredit of heterodoxy and the evils of various and other kinds on the recovered hope. Evangelical men were at a manifestly low ebb, even the most devoted of them betraying their ignorance of church or even Christian privilege by periodical gatherings for prayer that the Holy Spirit might be once more shed on souls. And meanwhile, eagerly forming societies to do thus anomalously the work which was the common responsibility of God's church. There was no real faith in the presence of the Spirit, no looking for his free action in the assembly, no expression of the one body of Christ, nor even sense of the church's ruined state any more than really waiting for God's Son from heaven. There was not even the consciousness of the true deliverance and heavenly associations of the Christian. The evangelical revival, whether of Wesley or Whitfield, or outside the borders of either was a pious reaction which insisted on the new birth and earnestness on behalf of perishing souls from the cold ethics and formality, if not deism, of the century before. But the calling and inheritance of saints, the purposes of God for the glory of God in Christ never fully dawned on evangelical hearts any more than on Puritans or even the reformers that proceeded. I have set before thee an open door which no one can shut. That's from Darby's translation. And so the next church we're going to look at is Philadelphia. To the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, These things saith he that is holy, he that is true, he that hath the key of David, he that openeth and no man shutteth, and shutteth and no man openeth. I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it, for thou hast a little strength, and hast kept my word, and hast not denied my name. Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews and are not, but do lie. Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet, to know that I have loved thee. Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. Behold, I come quickly. Hold that fast which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. Him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go no more out. And I will write upon him the name of my God, and the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven for my God. And I will write upon him my new name. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Well, following the French Revolution and uh, Napoleon's crowning himself, there was a number of books written on prophecy and a great stir. And there were conferences held in Albury, in the home of uh, Henry Drummond, and a result of those, Edward Irving was at some of those, uh, uh, Lady Powers Court uh, attended some of them. They came back to what was held in the first 300 years of the church's history after the apostles, that there was a premillennial second coming of Christ, and they set a date for that, I don't recall the date, um, they maintained historicism. Historicism is the doctrine that the prophecies of Daniel and Revelation are fulfilled or almost completely fulfilled. And in looking at those, they mix days and years and so on. And uh, they did also look at Israel restored nationally, but I believe they really confused it in a lot of ways uh, with the church restored nationally, but incorporated into the church. 
afterwards, there were some more conferences that were held uh, really overlapping. And Ladies Powers Court, whose personal interest was really stirred as to prophetic things, wanted to use her money to fund having uh, conferences as well. And they began in 1829 and 1830. There were two that were kind of private and then more public in 1831 to 1841. And uh, B.W. Newton of uh, Open Brethren fame said, I went to the first, 1829, and heard the address that alone would upset all prophetic truth. Mr. Darby was at that first conference. And then in reference to the more public conferences that began in 1831, Dr. Paul Wilkinson, who is currently living in Britain right now, said this in addressing uh, Dallas Theological. One man stepped forward in the sovereign purposes of God to help lighten the darkness, dispel the confusion, and chart a clear course for the church in readiness for Christ's return. The name of this uncompromising champion for Christ's glory and God's truth was John Nelson Darby. Paul Wilkinson is a real champion for, for uh, dispensational truth. Uh, anyway, I thought uh, his uh, comments on that uh, first more public conference were uh, quite helpful. So there's a little picture of Powers Court Castle where those were held. House of Henry Drummond up at the top. So I'd just like to give a little background on uh, JND. He certainly was the primary instrument in this work that was of the Spirit of God and recovery of the truth of God in a wonderful way. He was born in Westminster, London in 1800. His father was an English merchant, John Darby of Markley, Sussex, but heir to Leap Castle in Kings County, Ireland. So there's an Irish connection there. His mother uh, was a woman named Anne Vaughan, well-known in the New World. She was the daughter of Samuel Vaughan, a sugar plantation owner from Philadelphia who was uh, an acquaintance of George Washington. And also, I believe he was vice president of uh, one of the philosophical societies. So he may have embraced more of a deism um, uh, religion. Uh, J.N.D. was bereft of his mother when he's about five years old, uh, probably due to serious long-term illness. Uh, it could be that she died then, but more likely long-term illness. His uncle, uh, Benjamin Vaughn, was a close friend of Benjamin Franklin and a peace negotiator at the end of the War for Independence. And he had another uncle on the Darby side, Admiral Henry de Ster Darby, who commanded the Bellafron and fought under Admiral Lord Nelson against Napoleon's fleet in the Battle of the Nile, 1798. And that's where he got his middle name from, from Lord Nelson his godfather. He graduated a classical gold medalist from Dublin University, Trinity University in 1819, trained to be a lawyer. What is a classical gold medalist? The study of the classics would take up ancient Greek and Roman literature, politics, society, the languages themselves, and he graduated at the very top in those fields. But lest he should sell his talents to defeat justice, instead he sought to be ordained in the Church of Ireland in service for the Lord. His words were feeling that if the Son of God gave himself for me, I owed myself entirely to him. And seeing the so-called so-called Christian world was characterized by deep ingratitude towards him, I longed or complete devotedness to the work of the Lord. He says, my chief thought was to get around amongst the poor Catholics in Ireland, which he did on his 
start as a deacon, then later on a priest, I believe, 1824 to 1826. And in November 1826, he wrote, and it's the very first article in the collected writings called Considerations Addressed to the Archbishop of Dublin and the clergy who signed the petition to the House of Commons for protection. Well, it's a deep dive article. <laughs> and, but uh, he describes it. He says, I was just, I was about 26 years old at the utmost when it was written. But this was going to be something that was a catalyst of the Spirit of God and the work in his soul and understanding the truth. I may mention that just at that time, the Roman Catholics, that is in Ireland, were becoming Protestants at the rate of 600 to 800 a week. The Archbishop McGee imposed within the limits of his jurisdiction the oaths of allegiance and supremacy, and the work everywhere instantly ceased. And so what was imposed was um, a, that all of these converts had to pledge an allegiance to the King of England as head of the church. Remember Henry VIII said the King of England is the head of the Church of England. They had to pledge allegiance to him, and they were getting a lot of persecution from the Catholics, and so he appealed to the king for protection. Well, Darby says, I attach no importance to the paper, which I have never read since, but as the first germing of truth, which has since developed itself in the Church of God, and I pull a couple of quotes from that paper. He says, in speaking to the Archbishop McGee, what is the Church of Christ? Uh, and then he answers it. A people purified to himself by Christ, purified in the heart by faith, knit together by the bond of this common faith in him, to him their head, sitting at the right hand of the Father, having consequently their conversation commonwealth in heaven from whence they look for the savior the lord of glory philippians 3:20 as a body therefore they belong to heaven and another quote it amounts a, to a claim on behalf of the established church to protection from the civil sovereign why should my beloved and honored brethren choose a lower place choose not to have the fellowship of his sufferings and so you might say, as we say today, the light bulb went off. What is the church? Is the king really the head of the church? Who is head of the church? What is the composition of the church? Do we appeal to the sovereign of the nation for protection? Or do we have fellowship in the sufferings of Christ? And this was the, the catalyst, the beginning of the work of God in his soul and the recovery of the truth. But the Lord allowed an accident to take place in order for him to be laid aside from his work because his work consumed so much of his time. And on top of that, he was really still in a Romans 7 state. And he said, uh, I would fast often, I would fast uh, Monday and Tuesday. Well, if that was good, then I should fast Wednesday. Well, if that was good, then fasting Thursday too is even better. And pretty soon he was really wasting away. And there were those who thought he would die, but he would never let up on his labors. He would just beat himself up um, in, in seeking to pursue his ministry in, in the Church of England. He was under the bondage of the law and sin. He didn't know deliverance yet. And the work of the Lord was going to require, first of all, that personally he be delivered and then to open up the truth of God to him. And so in December 1826, his horse threw him against the doorpost. He's very severely injured. I think he had to go for surgery in Dublin, returned for a period of convalescence at his sister's house, his brother-in-law and sister's house. And in a short period of time, December to January, he came to understand an incredible number of truths. First, 
union with Christ was the first thought. And I'm giving these kind of in an order in the way they came. You know, often we think of the recovery of the truth with, with Mr. Darby as to the truth of the rapture. But it's it's helpful, it's good to understand. It started with truths as to himself personally before that which was collective. And that's how the order of things should be in our souls and it, when we seek to help others too. <laughs> Union with Christ. When I came to understand that I was united to Christ and that consequently my place before God was represented by his own. He understood that he was united to Christ. And what was, and that the place the Lord had before God was represented by his own place. That was the place he had. The next thing was, is seeing that that was his place, he really came into deliverance from sin and the law, and into Romans 8, 1 and 2. Um, there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. The spirit of life which is in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. And he had been a number of years in the state described in Romans 7. And uh, he says, I was forced to the conclusion that it was no longer a question with God of this, of this wretched eye, which had wearied me during six or seven years in the presence of the requirements of the law. Well, the next thing was the believer's position in Christ in the heavenlies, which is really Paul's gospel. I was in Christ, accepted in the beloved, and sitting in heavenly places in him. And then he looks around, and what about others? The union of Christ in the church and the heavenly place of the church, Paul's doctrine, really comes into view in his soul. This led me. This, this is just a continuation of the quote, I was in Christ, accepted in the beloved, and sitting in heavenly places in him. This led me directly to the apprehension of what the true church of God was, those who were united to Christ in heaven. You see, this is just, it's, it's like a cascade uh, in his soul. And he then, seeing what the church was, he saw the hope of the church and the any moment expectation of the Lord's coming. At the same time, I saw that the Christian having his place in Christ in heaven has nothing to wait for save the coming of the Savior in order to be set, in fact, in the glory, which is already his portion in Christ. He then started to lay hold of dispensational truth. He read the 32nd chapter of Isaiah, and he said, it taught me clearly on God's behalf that there was still an economy to come of his order and a state of things in no way established as yet. A king shall reign in righteousness, it says, and the effect of righteousness, peace and quietness, and my people shall dwell in quiet resting places. He saw this was a state of things in no way established yet. The consciousness of my union with Christ had given me the present heavenly portion of the glory, whereas this chapter clearly sets forth the corresponding earthly part. I was not able to put these things in their respective places or arrange them in order as I can now, but the truths themselves were revealed of God through the action of his spirit by the reading of his word. And so this really shows he probably held an Augustinian amillennialism doctrine previously, and really that there was no future millennium. Now he sees there is a coming dispensation different than anything that the world has ever seen yet. And then he also saw the ministry of the Holy Spirit, so the reaction of the Holy Spirit in the assembly. I saw in scripture that there were certain gifts which form true ministry in contrast to clergy established upon another principle. Ministry is of the Spirit. There are some amongst the clergy who are ministers by the Spirit, but the system is founded on an opposite principle. Consequently, it seemed impossible to remain in it any longer. And then he saw the fall and the ruin of the church. The careful reading of the Acts afforded me a practical picture of the early church, 
which made me feel deeply the contrast with its actual present state, though still as ever beloved by God. He said if the Apostle Paul were to come here now, he would not, according to the established system, be even allowed to preach, not being legally ordained. But if a worker of Satan, who is by his doctrine, denied the Savior, came here, he could freely preach. Oh no, I'm running tight on time here. I'm sorry. <laughs> Just want to point out something else. JND's notes on the Gospel of John uh, and uh, notes and comments, uh, volume seven. About 70% of the way through those, he'd written down Lord's Day, April 8th, 27, 1827. It's very likely these notes were written in 1827. And just a quick list, we won't go into quotes, but the things that he understood as we draw from those notes, there is more than one sphere of Christ's glory. It's a heavenly and earthly glory. Christ's earthly glory is po postponed until a future millennium. The Christian position in the heavenly church come out of those notes. The end of the testing of man, man in the flesh. The fact that we have now resurrection life, and it's probably a term that he invented. The present ruin of the church, the coming apostasy of the church, that the bride of Christ will be above in heaven during the judgments on the apostate church. Christ's coming for the church was prior to Daniel's 70th week when God began to deal with the Jews. That a future Jewish remnant would be there in the time of Jacob's trouble that there would be a personal antichrist over the apostate Jews, that Israel and Christ had a distinct earthly glory in the millennium and the church's part in Christ's glory, in Christ's millennial glory. To me, it's overwhelming going through those few slides and the breadth of truth that was recovered to him the first slide was just in those two months, December, January, maybe just the beginning of February, and then the other sometime middle April time frame, a little beyond in 1827. The breadth of practically all that we know and enjoy today was there in, in, a, in its uh, beginnings and its, in its uh, first buddings and his understanding of the scriptures. Only the Spirit of God could do that. Well, <clears throat> he leaves the Church of England in September 1827, and exercised by those truths that he saw. I'm not going to read the quotes. I'll leave them there. And then in November, December 1827, the breaking of bread began in the home of H.F. Hutchinson. And Jarby says, four persons who were pretty much in the same state of soul as myself came together to my lodging. We spoke together of these things, and I proposed to them to break bread the following Sunday, which we did. Others then joined us. I left Dublin soon after, but the work immediately began at Limerick. That was the next place he went, town in Ireland, and then in other places, he went over to Oxford, London, so on, Plymouth. Two years later, I went to Cambridge and Oxford, he says. Well, those four were H. Hutchinson, John Bellett, Edward Cronin, John Darby, possibly some accounts mentioned Mrs. Hutchinson being there as well. If I got it right, I think that's 9 Fitzwilliam Square, uh, where they first broke bread, and then it moved on to another building on Angier Street in Dublin, a little picture down below. By then, Mr. Darby had gone on before they moved out of Hutchins, Hutchinson's home. He says later in, in a letter to one who had been inquiring of those days, he said, I myself was, I was myself the beginning of what the world calls Plymouth Brethren, though we began in Dublin. The name Plymouth arose from the earliest publications which attracted attention, issuing thence 
and was so far harmless as no human name was attached to them. One cannot help the world giving some, that is names. The great question is what the word of God says. We do not meet on the ground of churches, but of the unity of the body of Christ and membership of that one body. Membership of a church I do not find in scripture. This is from the same letter. The vital truth is the personal presence of the Holy Ghost baptizing into one body, united to the head. There is another character of the church, the habitation of God through the Spirit. The corruption of the dark ages had made the realization of this more difficult, but has not altered the truth of the word. We have the promise which first led me to meet that wherever two or three are gathered together in Christ's name, he is in their midst. Only it must be in the unity of the body. I'm going to diverge just a little bit. Um, there are those who uh, would say there was that the work started before those four met in Hutchinson's home to break bread. And there was a previous gathering with Edward Cronin, but I don't believe it was the same thing. J.N.D. remarks about that. He speaks of the five that met at Fitzwilliam Square. And he says, I have read since that Cronin had already met with Wilson and some others, but they had broken up of that. I know nothing from the reminiscences of J.G.B. Well, <clears throat> what had taken place was that Cronin had been excommunicated because he wouldn't apply for special membership at an independent table because he saw only membership in the body of Christ. So the Spirit of God was working in his heart. Another brother protested the action of his excommunication, left the independent congregation, and they began to meet and study the word. If you would go to a town, you might be received by the independents for a time, but once they decided you were living there, you needed to apply for special membership, which he refused to do. So it left them outside of all the independent churches. They were known in the community as being excommunicated. And so they began to meet for the study of the word and after time saw their way clear to meet on Lord's Day morning for prayer and breaking of bread. Andrew Miller says, this was more the result of circumstances than of divine conviction. They were really forced into a place of separation. The truths that we had gone over that that JND had seen in those early days were not in, except in a little bit, uh, formed a part of where Edwin Cronin was at at that time. Kelly says, it is confirmed that is the breakup of that group by the fact that only Edward Cronin remained to take part in the Hutchinson meeting. So I don't believe that uh, meeting really was the beginning of the work though we see the the influence of the spirit of god working in the hearts of many as it came later uh to be seen right around the world as the truth spread i believe that work began right there with those four on uh fitzwilliam square another one that i really want to take up because it's 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 been it's been used in a, in a destructive way. It was the involvement of one Anthony Norris Gross. And I'm going to read um, from Andrew Miller's On the Brethren. Mr. Groves had to give up his professional duties and turn his attention to the study of theology. He wanted to go out in the, in the service of the missions. They said he needed to be ordained. So he had to get a degree. It was not necessary, however, that he should reside in Dublin during his studies, but that he should appear at the university for two or three times a year for examination to his, as to his attainments. It was during some of these periodical visits that he became acquainted with the brethren. As a Christian, he broke bread with them in Fitzwilliam Square, the meeting being at that time in existence. 
No, the work did not start with Anthony Groves. In the end, Anthony Groves became an opposer to that work. This was the extent of his connection with the young community. Indeed, he never agreed with their ecclesiastical principles, nor the ground they had taken in separation from all religious systems around them. In the year 1828, Mr. Groves had a lengthy conversation with some of the brethren on the subject of missions and the church, but as to the nature of the latter, that is the church, they could not agree. Mr. G warmly contended that the tares were to grow in the church to the end, which the brethren strongly resisted as unscriptural and necessarily opposed, opposed all wholesome discipline. The field is the world, not the church. And so Grove's doctrine under whom a number in Bethesda uh, came under his influence was that everyone should be saved irregardless of their ecclesiastical connections, their doctrinal teaching, and so on. And it greatly afflicted brethren. No, he was not the beginning of that movement. Well, just some things in uh, closing. Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I also will keep thee out of the hour of trial, which is about to come upon the whole habitable world to try them that dwell on the earth. Well, that midnight cry went out throughout Christendom, and it just reverberated around the globe. And the Holy Spirit had been preparing hearts to receive these recovered truths around the world. And dispensational truth was embraced by many believers. But the Philadelphian movement that we see in this letter to Philadelphia would only be in a remnant character. So not nearly as many believers were gathered out of the systems of men to the Lord's name alone, though they embraced the truth of the rapture though they embraced dispensational teaching. Interestingly enough, in many of the early books written on dispensational truth by those out in the systems of men, they will not even say where they got it from. They don't want to mention Darby. It wasn't until the rise of Reformed theology and, re and the, them attacking dispensational truth, pointing out, you got that truth from the despised John Darby that dispensational Christianity woke up to realizing where they had gotten that truth from because it had been covered. So it was really going to be in a remnant character. And uh, though the, the widespread nature of dispensational teaching and the hope of the church uh, were so thankful for, the work as to being gathered to the Lord's name alone was much smaller. Because of the impact of that truth, there is almost nothing as regards the truth held by believers today in fundamental Christianity that they did not get from this revival, even though they don't realize it. Almost nothing that is really in accordance to the scripture scripture that they hold as truth that they did not get from this work of the Spirit of God. And Darby's mission, really like Luther before him in the Reformation, had a very, had an apostolic character. I'm not calling him an apostle, don't mistake me, but it had an apostolic character and its wide effect upon the church. It was a unique gift and and work of the spirit of god and in raising him up and of course it spread to others and they were brought into that work right about the time of the truth coming over to the americas and to the continent of europe the second great awakening began to take place and in north america it centered in tennessee kentucky what is called the bible belt today where much uh, many uh, churches hold dispensational teaching. And so there was a work of the Spirit of God in preparing souls to receive the truth of God. 
But as we noticed, um, Kelly said, it pleased God of late to awaken the slumbering virgins by the midnight cry. Not only were the wise aroused, but the foolish. Nor did Satan delay to set up counterfeits so as to bring the discredit of heterodoxy and evils of various other kinds on the recovered hope. And so Mormonism, Irvingism, Millerism that led to Seventh-day Adventism, uh, led to the Millennial Dawn, Jehovah's Witnesses, those really uh, evil doctrines that were mixed up with them all developed at that time. The, the Satan got busy with his counterfeits. Well, our last letter, Laodicea, professing, really becomes the world, treated as the world. And they say, I am rich, am grown rich, and have need of nothing. That's a new translation. But what does the Lord say to them? He says, And knowest not that thou art wretched, miserable, and poor, and blind, and naked. I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich in white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thine eyes with I said, that thou mayest see. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. And so what is Laodicea? Philadelphia and Laodicea are really two spiritual conditions that come out of Sardis, Protestantism. Philadelphia was the work of the Spirit of God. The Laodicea is really in the indifferent response to that work. How many today are aware of what was recovered? How many have embraced dispensational truth? How many um, know the truth of the rapture and profess it? And yet we see widespread indifference to those truths today. No wonder Reformed theology is making inroads where dispensational truth was once held. It's the indifference to it. And when the challenges come, no one can open the scriptures and give answers because they're indifferent to it and they haven't dug into it and they haven't made it their own. And that's really the character related to see. I'm rich and increased with goods. It's just gainsaying interest. They say, because thou sayest, but they know not. They say, I have need of nothing, really, not even Christ. And so, Amazing to me how that sphere, influenced by dispensational teaching, has become the bastion today, at least in North America, of involvement with conservative politics. And it is defiling itself. Well, the Lord's appeal. He stands at the door and knocks. He's ready. Will anyone respond to him? personally, he'll unfold those things to them. Enjoy fellowship with him. Well, I've gone long over the time, but just thought of that uh, scripture uh, to Philadelphia, behold, I come quickly. Hold that fast which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. We can become infected with that lay of the sea and spirit ourselves and indifference to those things that have been recovered, that God's grace and mercies and relief for his people has brought us into. But above all, that we would hold fast to the hope of his soon return. Amen. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. We just close in prayer. Our God and our Father, we do. Well, this went a long time. We pray that it would be for blessing and profit. So we just commit this to thee and to thy hands for blessing.
may we have an appreciation of the truths that have been so liberally handed to us, to enjoy them, to walk in the good of them, that they might, the power of the Spirit of God, form us to be here more uh, for our Lord Jesus Christ as we wait for his return. We ask this in the precious name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Yeah. I mean, sorry, you bore with me a long time. I'm looking at my clock. I think that was almost an hour and a half. <laughs> You're very patient. <laughs> Thank you, Brother Steve. I think we could stay here all night. <laughs> Just so interesting and good. Steve, I know it wasn't a main point in your talk, which was very good, but you mentioned uh, Arminianism from that, uh, I don't know if it was a Swiss or a Dutchman, Jacobus Arminian or Arminius. Could you give a brief description of, of what he taught and, and what's involved in those who keep his hold on to his teaching today. I think you just kind of mentioned it in passing. I thought it might be helpful to just make, make a few comments on what it really consists of. Yeah, I had actually I'll put a whole slide in there, but trying to pare this down, I dropped it out. <laughs> um, Jacob Arminius was a Dutch reformer in Holland. And there was a man who wrote a long treatise on Calvinism and especially doctrines of uh, predestination. Very detailed, you know, exactly how it is God decides who's going to be saved and who's going to be lost and just the errors that came when the pendulum swung too far on Calvinism. And he reacted to that and basically uh, went back to um, uh, really Pelagianism, uh, you didn't go that far, but is the teaching that man has a, a free will and he is capable of responding to God and uh, to receive the gospel. Whereas Calvinism and really up to that point, the Reformation, Lutheranism, all really embraced election. And that the work of the soul, the first step was God's step. The first action was God's action. They didn't understand the way and how completely, but they saw that God had to act first. On Arminius's side, he more took up the thought that no, we're free agents. Um, the proposal is set before us and we act. Um, in the reception of the gospel. So really, he ended up veering away from election. Um, not nearly as far as Wesley did. Uh, but nonetheless, he was really rejected uh, by the Dutch reformers and those that followed him. And again, with the, with the way things were involved politically, they went right to uh, the prince who was over that part of the realm at that time, engaged him to cast everyone who might be a follower of Jacob Arminius out of any political offices, religious offices, you know, the whole bit. It was the same, same way that all those kinds of things have been handled. But when Wesley came along, he took up what Jacob Arminius had taught, and he developed it into Wesleyan Arminianism. And he went beyond, and he said... That, and I think uh, I think Nick Simon really took it up well in a previous meeting, but he said, no man is free. Yes, he, you know, there's not a denial that he's, he's born in sin and all these things, but that God gives what he calls pervenient grace, a certain measure of grace that enables him to either reject or receive the gospel. And... Uh, it, he denied the truth of election, that God has chosen some to be saved. Now, he went head on, head to head 
with George Whitfield, who was thorough Calvinist, and Jonathan Edwards, too, who was Calvinist, came from Puritan background. Um, but the Methodist uh, gospel really spread, especially in the United States, and they were willing to push as far as the American expansion went west. And so they carried the gospel, and they carried Arminianism with them as they went. And so that be, really ended up forming a large part of uh, fundamental Christian community until uh, the recovery of the truth. Because our early brethren clearly taught truths of election and predestination, but not all the extremes of Calvinism. They didn't preach a doctrine of eternal reprobation that God chooses some to be lost. And in the spread of dispensational truth, so did the truths of election come back in again. But that is being pushed back against now in a strong way. Open Brethren pretty much as a whole embrace Wesleyan um, Arminianism. And most of the Baptist churches today, same thing. And of course, goes without saying Methodists. Now, Methodists long ago dropped the gospel ball and have become very liberal, and the Baptists picked it up and carried it from there. Um, just an interesting note, if, if you came to visit New York and you were to drive around the hills and, and down into Pennsylvania and so on, every little town you come to has got a little Methodist church. They might be empty, every town, and they all look the same, <laughs> all kind of the same design, this tall white steeple, long narrow building, tall stained glass windows, little Methodist church. They're all over because of that spread of the gospel. They held revivals over and over again. They held so many revivals from northern part of Pennsylvania all the way up in Ontario that it became called the Burnt Over District. People got gospel hardened. And one guy came in in particular and would offer you a canned revival. He had a, a sinner's bench he put up there and, you know, set your podium up and bring speakers in and place for sinners to weep for their sins and he would just like a can theater and it became what's called the burnt over district and out of that is where came most of the false things that we listed there mormonism seventh day adventism the millerite great disappointment uh jehovah's witness came out of the burnt over district gospel hardened Anyway, sorry, I'm going on a long time ago. I read a comment uh, not too long ago that I thought was well put. It said, the brother said, Calvinism is wrong about God. Arminianism is wrong about man. And of course, we need to learn our thoughts of what man is by learning what God is first. But in Calvinism, it is wrong thoughts of God because it says God so loved the world, not God so loved just the elect. So they're wrong about God. And Arminianism is wrong about man because it thinks there's something good in man. And the scriptures teach, now teach, coming into the fullness after Christ came and the result in New Testament, that there is nothing in man. He, born not of the will of man or the will of the flesh uh, but of god and so wrong about man so it's uh it's it's beautiful and a real blessing to uh be able to embrace the truth and to see to to hold in the different parts of our minds and hearts uh, these two aspects of how god works and how man really ticks it's a it's a mercy a blessing I think Arminianism really fits with that uh, emotional revival type of gospel preaching, looking for this strong emotional response as proof of the reception of the gospel. It just fits with it. It's really producing results in man in that way. I think one of the uh, 
uh, fundamental differences between what came out of the Reformation and even the great evangelical revivals was that the emphasis was that God's purpose was man's salvation. Whereas the recovery of the truth in the last uh, 19th century realized that the, the, what, what's scriptural, uh, uh, that God's purpose according to scripture is his glory. And there's a fundamental difference there. If you overemphasize man, then uh, you get into these problems. But if you realize it's God's glory, the emphasis is on Christ and him as the object. And that makes all the difference. I know even uh, John Piper, some are familiar with the name of John Piper, has coined an interesting term called Christian hedonism, which is kind of one of the latest manifestations of uh, the thought that God's purpose is man's salvation. And so many of the churches concentrate not only on salvation, but also uh, they put a great deal of effort on shepherding, but there's often little emphasis on putting Christ first and the worship that belongs to him. You talk to most Christians, how often do you break bread to remember the Lord Jesus? Well, that's hardly in their vocabulary, but that's uh, one of the fundamental differences, I think, between what came out of the Reformation and even the following years up to the, uh, uh, up to the recovery of the truth. Yeah, that's helpful, Brother Eric. I, uh, it's really the centerpiece in that way that everything really hangs on that and outside of that you're gonna you're gonna get off in all kinds of various ways i know i was reading a article that was a kind of a summary of a conference meeting in 1987 in uh, ottawa which i recommend to anybody robert willard has put it together on the ground of gathering. And I, I was struck by a comment Mr. Bauman made. He said, uh, you know, he said, I knew a brother that used to be gathered. And he said, we used to enjoy Christ together. And then this brother got discouraged and he left and went to some church. And well, he says, when I meet him now, he's always telling me all that he's doing. So the emphasis is on what he's doing as a Christian rather than on what uh, his enjoyment of Christ. And I thought that was uh, exercising to all of us, really, because frankly, sometimes our meetings are pretty dead. But uh, that should encourage us, shouldn't it? That that's really God's purpose. When we get to heaven, the salvation of souls is going to be past tense. Even the shepherding of souls, at least in Christianity, is going to be past tense. But worship will go on forever, won't it? I also would comment that the enjoyment of Christ is inevitably if it's true will give rise to to work in the gospel so that's that's the fruit of it so that that's the evidence of it and to shepherding without a doubt but the danger is putting the cart before the horse isn't it exactly yeah steve you mentioned in your talk early on that the hope of the Lord's uh, return for us before the millennium was held in the early church for a, a good period of time. And I know you covered it in your last talk, but I'm a, a bad student. But I thought it was given up very, very quickly. But you mentioned today that it seemed to hang on there for maybe a, a, a century or two. Can you uh, refresh our memory on that? If if I said the Lord is coming for us, then I was uh, uh, misspoke. But the hope of the second coming of Christ, premillennial second coming of Christ, was generally what was held uh, up until Constantine came to the throne. And the expectation was the church was going to go through the tribulation. So you see that with those early Clement and Polycarp and those early documents that they were, you know, looking for the Lord to keep them and uh, to endure to the end to be saved. And then the coming of Christ would bring in the kingdom. 
So they were looking for a premillennial coming of Christ, not a premillennial rapture or post-tribulational rapture. It really was the coming of coming and setting up the kingdom they were looking for. Gotcha. So if I said coming for us, then then I I uh, misspoke. Very good. I'm glad you asked the question because if I did misspeak, I, I'm definitely glad to get that clear. I might have been putting words in your mouth from my uh, <laughs> my understanding or lack thereof. Yeah, it just it just always strikes me so it's it's so humbling and sobering that. Uh, like it could be said of previous privileges of the children of men, that our goodness was like the morning dew. It so quickly went away. And the best thing ever communicated to man was, uh, as you say, we became indifferent to it so quickly and lost sight of it so quickly. It's what a what a mercy that there's been a recovery of these things so that there is the opportunity as individuals certainly to to uh, embrace and enjoy them again didn't have to be that way the recovery i mean i think too uh, uh steve if I understand scripture properly, the remnant testimony actually began in Thyatira, didn't it? Uh, Mr. Kelly actually uses that word in his translation uh, in the second chapter of Revelation. So I believe there was a, a, a realization in a certain sense that they had to separate from the general church. And I realize that was developed more fully later on, but Nonetheless, that uh, remnant testimony begins with the end of Thyatira, doesn't it? And so you have uh, the last three churches uh, look forward to the Lord's coming rather than backwards to a restoration. Uh, and that's that's important. And the, the address to the overcomer, of course, as we've often heard, is only made to the overcomer at that point. Rather, the first three churches, uh, it was made to... Uh, uh, to uh, to all, the hope was that there would be a restoration back to the original condition. But beginning with Thyatira, which I believe really is the Reformation, or we might say the pre-Reformation, people like, as you mentioned, Wycliffe and Huss and people like that, Jerome, um, they were the ones that uh, began to separate from the general church. How, how intelligent they entirely were is maybe open to question, but certainly by their stance they were beginning to separate from the church and they are called a remnant aren't they yeah i think that's that's correct the remnant is first identified there um i know i put in my in my notes uh just but the philadelphian movement would only be in a remnant character so not nearly as many believers were gathered out of systems of men unto the Lord's name alone. But I think I'd also put a title um, over Philadelphia. Uh, a remnant separated from a corrupt religious world. But uh, that's not the first place. So... It's, I'm glad to yeah, identify that. That's the first time we get that language is with Thyatira. Yeah, and I think it's important too to distinguish between a moral remnant and a positional remnant. So I think the remnant that we're talking about in Thyatira is more of a positional remnant because they realized they couldn't go on with the status quo. Uh, but there's always been a moral remnant, hasn't there? Those who acted devoted, those devoted men who acted according to the truth they had. Um, they're called overcomers. But uh, we have to be careful because sometimes we even hear the term uh, a remnant within a remnant. 
And uh, some people object to that, but some of the writers use that expression. And what I think it simply means is that it's one thing to be in a remnant position. It's another thing to be in a remnant condition. It's important to be in both, isn't it? And that's good because you can look at the seven churches and at any given time in the church's history, you can find the state of things in all seven somewhere. You'll find a Philadelphia somewhere. You'll find a Sardis somewhere. You'll find an Ephesus somewhere. I think at any given time, you, there could be a, an application somewhere uh, on all of those. And today, well, there's not a worldwide persecution of the church like in Smyrna, but there's a Smyrna somewhere today, you know. Um, so it's, I think in that way, we need to see it as well. So that's, I appreciate that point about remnant morally and positionally. That's, a, that's important to uh, get a hold of. Thank you. And so we can be thankful for those who, even in our day, may not be separated positionally, but they act according to the truth they have. Um, he that is not against us is for us in that sense, isn't it? Well, thank you, Steve. Um, I hope that I can get those slides from you. I'll shoot you an email if that's okay. Did a lot of research. I appreciate that. Yeah, it's... Uh... When you think of the, the breadth of church history, it's just very, very little snippets. <laughs> and you're passing over a lot of wonderful accounts mm. and stories and things that reach our hearts so much, you know, but to accomplish the end in view, had to really limit it. But yeah, I'll, uh, I'll uh, get them to you. I think I got to break it up maybe into three files, the first, second, and third. So it kind of sends a little easier, and then I'll send it to Sister Grace, too. So. Yeah, I, th I think uh, Leo or Grace put the second one up online, if I remember right. I think I saw it there. On... It yeah. is. It's the first two combined in one file. Okay. Eric, uh, if you don't mind, would you clarify what you said, the difference between the first three churches and the last four? If you can remember yeah the first three churches uh uh they all go back the the message to the overcomer is that they might be restored to the initial condition you'll notice that the the uh when it says uh for instance uh he that hath an ear let him hear what the spirit saith unto the churches and then it mentions to him that overcomes so the overcomer is looked at after the uh, mention of the uh, of the spirit speaking to the uh, seven churches. So the thought was that there could possibly have been a restoration back to the original condition. And this is important, like Steve was pointing out, um, there is the truth of the ruin of the general church testimony. It's not really the ruin of the church. I know uh, sometimes we hear that and we have to be careful about that, don't we? Because there's there's still a collective testimony, but it's the ruin of the general church testimony. In other words, just because a person calls himself a Christian, you can't positionally identify with them. There has to be a separation. So the remnant separation began with Thyatira, the fourth church. And uh, as we've often heard, the four, the last four churches go on to the end because they look forward to the coming of the Lord in a certain sense. Uh, a remnant is, is identified. You get that in um, looking at Re uh, Revelation chapter 2. Um, it says uh, um, in verse 24, But unto you I say, unto the rest in Thyatira, or Mr. Kelly translates it, unto the remnant in Thyatira. Uh, and I believe those were the reformers, or at least the pre-reformers. You remember, as Steve pointed out, Sardis is really not the Reformation. We often hear that. It's really Protestantism. The Reformation actually came before uh, Sardis uh, and before Protestantism. Uh, 
Um, but it began with people like Wycliffe and Huss and so on. But then notice, uh, who have not known the depths of Satan as they speak, I will put upon you no other burden, uh, but that which ye have already hold fast till I come. So rather than looking back to the, the restoration of the original condition, beginning with the remnant in Thyatira, they look forward to deliverance by the Lord's coming, the rapture, really, although they may not have understood that very well. But they realized that uh, the church was, in general was corrupt and that the Lord was going to separate them from that. And then notice, too, it says, um, uh, and he that overcometh and keepeth my works unto the end, to him will I give power over the nations. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron as the vessels uh, of a potter shall they be broken to shivers, even as I received to my father. And I will give uh, him the morning star. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the spirit saith unto the churches. So notice that expression, he that hath an ear, let him hear what the spirit saith unto the churches, is only addressed to the overcomers. Previously, uh, it was addressed generally to all, but now it's only addressed to the overcomers. And that's true, really, uh, of, the last, of, the, of the last four churches. Brother Steve, just a small question, because it caught my eye. The, um, the thing that the um, priest told Luther, he mentioned uh, a Saint Bernard, uh, why did he mention this, and who is this Saint Bernard? Saint Bernard, I think, lived in uh, oh, I'd have to look it up, but like the 500 to 700 AD, maybe in there, or a little later. And he's called Bernard of Clairvaux. And oh, okay, I think it's this one I was thinking about. He is from the beginning of the. 12th century. I believe he was from Dijon, France. I I don't recall. He was instrumental in encouraging the Crusades. Yeah. So that is Bernard of Clairvaux. I just don't remember off the top of my head exactly where he fits in in the chronology. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But why have... is he mentioned there in the in what the that the monk that was speaking to Luther said, remember what St. Bernard said, that the testimony of the Spirit of God to your soul is thy sins be forgiven thee. And so he's saying, remember what St. Bernard said, that the Spirit of God tells you, Luther, your sins are forgiven, you know. And that's really what he needed to hear at that time, because he was just struggling under the law. And to know that he had forgiveness of sins, uh, that was uh, a tremendous light. But then as he took up Romans later and actually preaching it, teaching it, he's getting more, more light. So he comes to the just shall, you know, just shall live by faith. And then it really just opens up to him. Thank you for that clarification. Yeah, St. Bernard wrote the hymn, O Head Once Full of Bruises. So he was a real believer, but as Steve said, he actually supported the uh, Crusades, even against the Waldenses, if, if I recall right. Uh, I just uh, say, Steve, I was touched by those three ladies that morally kind of made the sort of awakening of the truth and that God had planted them, so to speak, and provided for their circumstance to do that and I never realized that before thank you uh T Karen's history the testimony through the ages he really brings that out nicely that the spirit of God was feathering the nest preparing for the recovery of the truth he brings that aspect of things out in a nice way and he takes those women up and how they really used all they had but that the uh, the poem the three bitters, um, you can look it up online. It's three bitters, not b i t t. It's b i d d, as in bidding at an auction. 
three bidders, and Roland Hill was preaching street, out, out in open air, and a crowd had filled the road, and Lady Ann Erskine came along in her carriage, and the road's blocked. And her horsemen get down and they're like, get everybody, get out of the way, you know, because she's related to royalty and this and that. And Roland Hill steps down, he stops the carriage. And he says, I'm going to have an auction. Who will bid for this woman? And he goes through in his preaching, the world's going to bid, Satan's going to bid, and Christ is going to bid. Who's going to get her? <laughs> and she got saved. And then she went on to use her fortune for the Lord. Yeah, there you go. It's a it's a beautiful poem. Bring tears to your eyes, I'll tell you. I couldn't read it out loud to everybody. I would I'd lose it. But uh, it's well worth reading. Fascinating, isn't it? How God works history. I, I remember just a quick comment Clarence Lundin made once, just so succinct. He said, "Yes." God raised up the British Empire to rid the world of pirates uh, to facilitate the spread of the gospel. A lot shorter than uh, the historians put it. Yeah, Lady Huntington was really the giant in that period, wasn't she? She supported the Wesleys and Whitfield and, Ro and Roland Hill and many of them. Yeah, we're not even sure that her husband was a believer, um, but she was a, a giant in the uh, 18th century England, wasn't she? I was also struck by how the testimony seemed to have fallen away in so many countries and what you said about how it had spread and then just disappeared and, and that England had been like the last bastion, as it were. And i just so encouraged by the what you had said about that God had not left it to, to die. It just, he brought it back. Yeah, I just, it really struck me that expression, you know, uh, except the Lord had left us a seed. we had been like Sodom and like Gomorrah. And really in the hands of man, that's where it would have gone. But the spirit of God is, has other plans, you know. <laughs> Lord has another design. He has a church that he gave himself for, and he's going to have her with him. Um, and uh, uh, nothing is going to uh, to change that purpose of God in Christ. You know, I think it's similar to um, in in Alexander's uh, conquests before the Roman Empire came on the scene was extremely rapid, a tremendous extent, and it really installed the Greek language as the trading language of the world. And the New Testament scriptures are written in Greek, and so wherever they went, people could read them. And I, I find a, an equivalent in the spread of the British Empire um, that the English spread around the world, and... Uh, has become the trading language of the world. And that's the language that God was pleased to use in connection with those who he raised up for the recovery of the truth and all that good written ministry has largely been in English. Um, because I think the intent of the Lord was going to get spread worldwide. Um, so I, I think in a similar way, he moved empires to, with with the thought of recovery of truth in mind. I hope I'm not over exaggerating, but that's really how I see it. <laughs> well, we do have to mention though that uh, England's motives were not always the best, were they? God used them, but it's not because the English motives were always the best. Uh, brother, I have another question of the letter to Tiatira. What are the greatest work, greater works that are associated to the church at that, at that time. It's mentioned in the beginning of the letter, I believe. So where it says uh, the last to be more than the first? Yes, if you have any thought on that. And, and there may be other thoughts, so I welcome what others might have, but as, as Thyatira progressed, the persecution of the faithful got greater 
and greater and greater. And the, uh, the, the manifestation of, of the spirit of Christ and the faithful became greater and greater and greater in their works and, and so on. And so that's how I've taken it. Um, someone's likened it this way. You have Elijah and Elisha. And really, Elijah has some works of power and so on up front. But the works of, of uh, Elisha later on, after Elijah, are greater. And they're more connected with grace. Someone just had mentioned how uh, perhaps in the, in the sufferings and persecution uh, that developed and grew, there was a greater manifestation in the faithful of the life of Christ. But if others have thoughts, I appreciate it. That's That was my thought. I don't know if it's 100% correct. Well, there has been faith in every generation, hasn't there? Um, but uh, it then goes on to speak about Jezebel, how she corrupted the whole system. But there have been overcomers in every every generation. God makes sure that that's true. Okay, thank you. Uh, I was thinking if you would uh, tell any great works that the Catholic Church in particular would uh, be associated with. But yeah, I, I believe it's a, a good answer already to, to know that there is always a remnant that is working. I've got a little note, Leo, that I wrote in my Bible, and I don't know where it came from, but in connection with those works, the last to be more than the first, I've got a note, the hunted and persecuted remnant of the uh, and witness of the dark ages that uh, the pressure just grew and grew. So I don't know that it's really the Catholic Church at large, but they were part of that. There was really not the divided exactly so much like you see between Protestantism and Catholicism. There was an Eastern and Western Church and so on, but largely um, those who were persecuted and hunted looked at themselves as part of the church. And yeah, it uh, says that they tolerated Jezebel. So yeah. the way they were inside and tolerating what was happening. Yeah, yeah very good. The responsible element was tolerating her, the angel. <laughs> 